Good evening, everyone. My name's Emma Weatherly. I'm a mum to two beautiful girls, Alyssa and Hannah, a wife to my husband, Robert, an accountant, and I have FSHD. I'd like to thank FSHD Global Research Foundation for inviting me here to speak tonight. It's so humbling and very exciting that over 600 people are here tonight wanting to understand FSHD and find a treatment and a cure. We need one. So here's my story. I was a healthy, active kid. Here I am at about ages two and seven. I wasn't the most coordinated child. I fell over often and easily, and I complained of aching legs and knees, which was put down to growing pains. And after numerous doctor's visits, my mum was told I was playing on her sympathies and there was nothing wrong with me. I was good at school and I learned ballet, jazz and tap. I played piano, I still play piano, I rode horses and even competed in some camp drafts and gym carnas on my horse Buddy, who I still have today. Somewhere around the age of eight, it was noticed that my smile was wonky and I couldn't pucker up and make a kissy face. Here are two school photos I have for comparison. The one on the left is me at about six years old and the one on the right is about nine years old. And you can see in these photos that my smile started to look a little lopsided. I'm adopted and I had very limited medical history provided to me. Um, so muscular dystrophy was never on our health radar, never considered a possibility. I can remember somewhere around the age of 14 or 15 that I noticed my lips looked uneven in the mirror when I spoke. So I spent hours talking to myself in the mirror, making the other side move so much so that they looked even. And I must have gotten pretty good at it because hardly anyone commented on my wonky lips anymore. Um, I was a girl who'd ridden horses since I was about eight. And I was fairly good at generally staying on. So I was pretty embarrassed one day. I was about 16 years old and I was competing at a gymkhana on Buddy. And I was in a barrel race and we rounded the corner of a barrel and I just slipped off his back, just fell off sideways and couldn't regain my balance. And looking back now, we probably know it was my core muscles starting to weaken. These days I have trouble even sitting upright in a car when it goes around a corner. This is a photo taken that day. Even after my fall, I still had a great day and came home with a second place ribbon. Mum and Dad were taking videos of me that day and watching the videos back later. I could hear my dad say, oh, she runs like a duck. And I did run like a duck. I didn't ever question it. I knew I couldn't run fast and there wasn't any way I'd ever try it for hurdles, but I could run but my legs kicked out to the sides. I couldn't ever push myself out of a pool using my arms, so I used to find an excuse to be near the steps or just kind of pull myself out pretty undignified. I also had trouble keeping my arm up in class, so I just did what other kids did and looked like a lazy student and held one arm up with the other. I slept with my eyes open a little bit. I had dry eyes and that led to eye ulcers. And when we look back now and put it all together, it seems pretty obvious. But at the time, none of those things were considered odd or considered in it together. And none of them made any doctor ever suggest that I might have something seriously wrong with me, let alone muscular dystrophy. I just got on with my life. I went to uni and graduated as an accountant, got married and completed my CPA. My husband and I started a family and had our two beautiful girls. My pregnancies were a little rough and looking back there was likely complications from the FSHD but we didn't know that at the time. I had several falls and fractured my ankle at one stage and had other muscle related weaknesses but my babies arrived happy and healthy so we put it down to clumsiness and never thought any more about it. 
Here's a photo of my husband and I with our little girl Alyssa back in 2007. And a picture of me when I was pregnant in 2009 with my youngest daughter Hannah. My clumsiness did return though. When Alyssa was only 10 days old, I was walking through a shopping centre and my legs just went out from under me and I fell over, letting my poor little baby fall to the ground too. I was pretty distraught at having put my brand new baby in that situation. I was so guilty and I felt like a terrible mother. And after that day, I didn't trust myself to walk carrying her. I used a pram or a trolley. And that made me feel like a failure because what mother can't manage to hold her baby safely? A similar thing happened when Hannah was little too. One day I was lifting her from a trolley and putting her back into the car and I lost my footing and I fell over. This time I managed to keep her off the ground but I hurt myself trying to save her. And it was just accepted in my little family that I fell over. And when we were out and about, my husband Robert carried our babies if they needed to be carried. Then one day at work in 2013, I tripped up a small step and fell hard and dislocated my knee. After four months of physio, I still couldn't move my foot up and down and had what they termed drop foot. An MRI scan showed a large amount of muscle wastage in both of my legs. And this was the first sign that we had that anything was seriously wrong. I saw two neurologists who didn't know what the problem was. And the first one even advised me that it was because I was carrying extra weight and she thought that fat had infiltrated my muscles. Then one day in a conversation with my GP, he noticed my wonky lip. He asked me how long my face had been affected. And I brushed him off and said my lips had been that way since childhood, so it wasn't related. But he was concerned and told me to have a look at FSHD and muscular dystrophy online and come back and tell him what I thought. I went home and did some Googling. And as I read the case studies and the symptoms, it was like reading a story about myself. Stories of people falling easily, being told to watch where they walk, trouble drinking through a straw, eyes that don't close, fatigue and pain and weakness. It was all me. So I went to see another neurologist in May of 2013 and he confirmed straight away that he believed I had FSHD and requested a genetic test to confirm. Uh, it took four months to get the genetic test results back, so it wasn't until September 2013 that we had our fears realised when we received news that the test was positive. When telling me about the result, the neurologist didn't pull any punches. He just said, you have FSH, there's no treatment, no cure. You should be happy that you don't have Duchenne's because if you had that, you'd be dead already. FSHD won't kill you, but it'll make a mess of your life. Don't make your muscles tired or they'll waste away. But don't sit and not use them because they'll waste away. Eventually, probably your, all your skeletal muscles will waste away, but it's a normally a slow progression, so don't worry too much about it. Just avoid injuries and be careful. Oh, and 20% of patients end up in a wheelchair. He gave me a pamphlet on ankle foot orthosis to help with my drop foot. And that was it. No hope no direction and not really much help. I left that office with one goal and that was not to be one of the 20% of people that need a wheelchair. I would keep myself safe, avoid injury and keep walking. And that was my whole plan. Because at that time, I thought to be healthy and independent, I needed to be able-bodied, which meant I had to be walking. My whole vision of what it meant to be an independent, happy person, a competent mother, a successful accountant, all of it was in my head at least, someone who wasn't a wheelchair user. So of that whole diagnosis, that was the message that I took away, avoid the wheelchair. But it's pretty hard as a mother of two who works four days a week to run a house, keep up with the kids and stay rested. I tried to take my diagnosis in my stride and keep up with everything I used to do because walking was my goal. 
My legs and my lower back got considerably weaker after my injury and simply refused to keep up with my plan. I'd spend each night sitting back up in a recliner with ice packs on my knees and back to manage the pain. I used TENS machines, I bought an NMES machine and took Panadol. My eldest daughter, Alyssa, wrote a story at school one day about each of our family members' favourite things. She came home very proud with it. It said, Alyssa loves to dance, Hannah loves to do craft, Daddy loves to work in his shed, and Mummy likes to sit down with an ice pack. She thought, because I did that so often, that that was my favourite thing to do in the whole world. So my desire to stay independent and active to stay walking was actually costing me my health and comfort. My stubbornness and refusal to let my body tell me what it could do was actually limiting my options. You're not being active and independent if you just don't go places. Through FSHD Global Research Foundation at one of the science updates, I met some other FSHD patients and was able to talk to other people who understood this condition and what it means. I came to understand that many FSHD patients aren't forced into a wheelchair. They choose to use one as a health aid to enable them to live their lives and stay independent and active. The decision to start using a wheelchair kind of snuck up on me. I tore the ligaments in my ankle, which required surgery to repair. And after the surgery, I was, um, after the surgery, I had my leg in a cast and was in a wheelchair for six weeks or so. This was my cast. When you're a mother of two, you choose the pink cast when you have girls. This was my first introduction to using a wheelchair and it was amazing to realise how helpful I found it. I could go out and about, even with a leg in a cast, and feel less pain and fatigue than I did normally. So in a way, the surgery helped me realise that the chair wasn't the limiting, confining, negative thing that I thought it was. It can be an independence tool for me, and I consequently decided to get my own chair for regular use. Um, the wheelchair gives me stamina and strength, and I can use it to tackle big days. And for me, it's become my ticket to independence and freedom. It helps me get places, and it helps me manage the pain and fatigue. So now, barely two years after my diagnosis, I've done the complete opposite of what I thought I would do. I struggle with FSHD. I don't admit it often. It's frustrating getting tired and sore all the time. I'm slow, uncoordinated, and I feel life is just a constant juggling act, trying to balance staying active, independent and mobile, and doing the things I want to do, while not overdoing it to avoid being sore. I think this balancing act in itself is a skill to be learnt, and I'm starting to get the hang of it. FSHD has changed my marriage. My wonderful husband, Robert, who's here with me tonight, has taken on the role of my carer now, as well as my husband. I'm very capable and independent at this point still, but there's a lot that he helps me with. He does the lion's share of the housework now and lifts and assembles my wheelchair for me when we go out. He helps me in any way that I need it and after surgery he helps me dress and shower and never complains. When I was first diagnosed, I sat him down and told him that I understood if this wasn't a future that he was willing to take on that if he was going to leave, now would be the time while I can still set up a life without him. But he never hesitated in his answer to me that he's signed up for life, in sickness and in health, and loves me no matter what. And to have someone's complete and total love like that when facing something like this makes a world of difference. And I want to thank him here tonight for always being there for me. <laughs> He doesn't like attention, so he won't like that. <laughs> but he's my rock. So now I look to the future. As any mother would, my concerns centre around my family. We don't know yet whether our two daughters have FSHD. 
We didn't know that I had it when I had them. They each have a 50% likelihood of having it. I already feel indescribable guilt at the thought that I might have passed this on to them. If there was a treatment or a cure available or any advantage to early diagnosis, I would have them tested. But until that day comes, I won't. There doesn't seem to be any benefit in us knowing now and it might just limit them for their future. I'm going to show you a photo. This is my little Alyssa at her christening day. This is one of my favourite pictures from her christening and I, I bet any other mums with FSHD can pick what I love about this picture. It's not her bonnet or the loving look that I'm giving her, it's her lips. Look at those beautiful, evenly, perfectly puckered lips. I'll show you a test now that I regularly give my daughters. This is Alyssa and Hannah showing you their kissy faces. They think it's all just fun and games, and I want them to keep thinking that. But I'm constantly checking their lips to see if they're showing any signs of the lopsided FSHD smile. When they fall over or say their legs ache, I'm always analysing it to see whether I think this is it starting, whether they should be tested. I second guess myself all the time about whether we should test them. But for now, I think it's best to let them live their lives to the fullest and live with the assumption that they don't have it. So let's assume they don't have it. Marriage and children is probably in their future. I look at the kind of support my mum gives to me, like many doting nanas do. She's always at our house cooking meals, doing the ironing, minding the children. She's looking after them tonight, flew all the way down to Sydney to mind them so that Robert and I could be here tonight. And I wonder, will I be able to do all of the amazing things that she does for me, for my girls' children? By that time, will I even be able to hold my grandchildren in my arms? This is a photo of me holding Alyssa and Hannah. When they have kids, will I be able to drive myself to their house and cook them a meal? I don't know, but I know that I'll offer them my support in whatever way I can, and I'll be the best mum that I can be. That's all I can do is focus on the things that I can control and have faith that the treatment or cure is just around the corner. I try to stay positive and focus on my ability to adapt. That's what FSHD patients do. We have an amazing capacity for adaption. We might not do things the same way as other people. We might take longer or need some kind of tool or device to help, but we find a way. I think that's the reason that diagnosis takes a long time. It's a slow progression and the sufferer just adapts without even realising it. I can't tell you the day that I suddenly started to throw my legs out sideways to run. It just happened. And I can't tell you the day I couldn't run anymore or when I stopped being able to lift my leg up high enough to get on my horse or ride my bike. I can't tell you the day that I couldn't lift my toes in the air anymore because I didn't notice. I just found other ways to do the things that I wanted to do. But all of these things did happen. Since my diagnosis, I've put a lot of energy into understanding my condition and understanding my choices. I love having health aids available and I use them to stay independent wherever possible. Here's a photo of my home office setup, showing some nifty arm supports that let me work without pain. I use a headset with my phone, so I'm not holding my arms up for long periods. Under that is the hand-controlled quad bike I use to get around our family farm now instead of riding my horse. And on the right is me in my wheelchair that I have at home with power-assisted wheels. I have an electric recliner at home now because I can't push a manual recliner in. I have hand controls on my car and I use an AFO to lift my toes when I walk for me. But probably the biggest change that we have made as a family is to move in closer to town in Brisbane to reduce our commute and build an accessible house next to a train station so that I can maintain my independence long after driving becomes too difficult. We're putting in a pool so that I can have the relief that floating in water brings and the gentle exercise that water offers from the comfort of my own home. 
I often fall at the local public pool because the walkways are very slippery getting from the pool to the change rooms. And this makes me really self-conscious, so I rarely go. I like to do things on my terms and not wait for the disease to dictate to me what's needed. But there are always challenges that come along and injuries are probably the biggest hurdle that I face and they're out of my control. I got a nice light wheelchair made of titanium that only weighs nine kilos with detachable power wheels so that I can lift it in and out of the car by myself. But a few weeks ago, I was lifting my wheelchair out of my car on my way to work and I lost my footing and dislocated my shoulder. Any normal healthy person would probably have a sore shoulder for a few weeks and do some rehab and get better. But when you have FSHD, nothing's that simple. My shoulder was left dislocated at the hospital for over four hours while I found a doctor who knew enough about muscular dystrophy to confidently relocate my arm. And I've torn all the ligaments in my shoulder, so it just keeps dislocating now. I'll be asleep in my bed and go to roll over and wake up in pain and realise my shoulder's out of its socket. I'm very lucky because often I don't need to go to hospital because Robert's now learnt to put it in for me. But now more surgery is needed because I need to have the ligaments repaired. When your legs don't work very well, your arms are your lifeline. So the thought of only having one properly functioning arm after surgery and it being my weaker arm is quite daunting. I won't be able to push myself in a wheelchair, look after my children, drive, cook, clean, or even wash my hair while I recover. I was told by my surgeon that I won't be able to lift my arm forwards for 12 weeks. And I won't even be able to walk with a walking stick because I use my right hand when I walk with a stick. I'll have to use an electric chair. Luckily, the accessible home build that I mentioned before is well underway and we've managed to find an amazing builder, Clarendon, who are working like crazy to have the house ready for us, hopefully prior to my surgery. Mind you, this was an adventure in itself. A builder that's willing and able to build an accessible home, in Brisbane at least, is hard to find. And the first two builders we approached weren't equipped to build the home that we needed or didn't want to bother. And Clarendon have been great because not only are they equipped to build the home that we need with my requirements, like a shower with no hob, recessed sliding doors, wider hallways, suitable appliances, but they're actually suggesting other improvements to make my life easier, like a ramp out to our patio area and a slide out bin. If I had the surgery now in the house that we're in with no wheelchair access, I wouldn't be able to go to the bathroom myself, fit through my bedroom door, go out to our patio, or even get myself a drink as my chair doesn't have space to turn in our kitchen. I'd probably have to go to rehab for at least the majority of the 12 week period where I can't move my arm and would be away from my family. But since hopefully I'll be in our accessible home, I'll be home in a few days and that makes the world of difference because I don't want to be away from my little girls for that long. So while the recovery will be difficult I'm sh and I'm sure my husband and mum will find it just as hard doing everything for me, I'll be in my home surrounded by people I love so I'll be okay. Of course, now I'm trying to imagine building a new house, having it just completed, and instead of the homecoming I'd planned where we establish gardens, unpack, and swim in the pool and really settle in, I'll be heading off to surgery and then a mobile for 12 weeks. The gardens and house set up will have to wait because I'm sure Rob will have enough on his plate caring for our two daughters and for me. There are unknowns with any surgery, but when you have FSHD, and the surgery will leave you mobile for any period of time, you go into the operation knowing that you may lose significant function by the time you move again. There's no alternative though, so it'll be a time of uncertainty, and it can be always a time of uncertainty, even after minor falls or injuries. From this little incident, I also face another problem. I can't lift my wheelchair into my car anymore. My little Corolla, bought in 2012, before we had any idea that we were facing this journey, is too small to fit a hoist or even just an assembled wheelchair. 
and I can't fit a roof hoist because I have power assisted wheels. So now we also need to buy a new car. One that can fit assembled wheelchair in the back and buy a hoist to lift the chair and refit my hand controls to the new car. And until all of that happens, I can't really work or leave the house or do anything that requires more than a short work, walk alone. Facing surgery, the uncertain recovery, limited ability and independence, and an unexpected financial burden all at once can really take its toll. So the threats to my independence were never about the wheelchair itself. It's being able to accommodate it into my life and into the environment around me. It's about my attitude and changing my mindset to be open to using the amazing technology around me. The one thing that could guarantee my independence and that of my children would be a cure. And I think it's FSHD Global Research Foundation that will be the one to find it. They're so close. Since my diagnosis was delivered to me, one with no hope and no chance of recovery, I've learned so much. The research being done now is so encouraging and we've learned amazing things. If a cure is found and I'm lucky enough to receive it, I would go running on a beach. I would ride a bike. I would ride my horse again. I'd go roller skating with my kids and I'd go skiing. But the number one difference that it would make to me would be the next time my daughter asks me if her legs are going to be like mine one day, to which I currently just say a brief, I hope not, is that I could say to her, no, your legs will be fine like mine will be. And all of you here tonight are helping us make that happen. So thank you from my family to yours for being here tonight and doing something real and tangible to help make that happen. Thank you.